Hi everyone, this is a SELF 2020 open source module. In this module, we're going to be discussing supporting students with low instance disabilities during distance learning. My name is Nikki Mayu and I am an instructional coach with the specialized development cohorts at SELF and I am the, uh, the coach for our supporting students with low incidences cohort as well as our supporting students with autism cohort. So before we dive right into our content, we're going to start with a little pop quiz. Which of these disability categories is not considered low incidence in schools? Intellectual disability, mild, traumatic brain injury, autism, or visual impairment? So if you're watching this webinar, go ahead and just think of your answer in your head and hold it there. And we will give just another second. Okay, if you chose number one, intellectual disability mild, you would be correct. Intellectual disability mild is considered a high incidence disability in schools. And the criteria for high and low incidence is typically, does it occur in 0.5 to 1% somewhere in that range of the student population if it if it occurs in that low of a percentage, it's considered low incidence. If it occurs higher, it's generally considered high incidence. But something interesting to note is that autism, um, as we get better at diagnosing autism and we learn more about it, um, the frequency with which autism occurs in the student population is on the rise, or we're, we're discovering it because we're better able to diagnose. And so in the future, we may see autism move from a low incidence disability to a high incidence disability. And we already know that autism is a wide spectrum and you can find students on the autism spectrum in every setting of the school building. Okay, so that's just something to get us thinking about low incidence disabilities and what that means for settings and for schools. And as we're going to dis discuss today, what it means for distance learning. So one more note on language as well. That term low incidence disability, we talked about what it means that low incidence is referring to the rate at which we find that particular disability in the population. But we wanna make sure that we, we know and that we communicate to other stakeholders that low incidence does not equate to low priority. That is not the connotation that that term should have. Um, and that has never been more true than it is now during distance learning. Equity for students with low incidence disabilities and for the full range of accommodations and modifications has never been more important than in this very particular moment of COVID-19 distance learning. So I really want to ground us before I um, talk a little bit more about strategies that teachers can use with students with low incidence disabilities. I want to first prioritize and uplift the voices of both the parents in our community and the students themselves. So on this slide, you'll see a couple of quotes of things that parents are saying about their experience with distance learning for their students with low incidence disabilities. Now, all of these quotes did come from spring 2020 during that first phase of distance learning right after COVID-19 um, necessitated it. And so just to give you that context, this was kind of the round one of distance learning for schools. As you can see, as you read these quotes, some common themes are parents really recognizing and appreciating teachers' efforts to accommodate their kids, teachers' efforts to make distance learning work for them and recognize that they are working very hard. That is, um, that is held in balance with also a theme of just parents feeling pretty overwhelmed. Um, pretty overwhelmed and in some cases really frustrated with seeing their students start to regress or not make the same progress that they were when they were in the school setting. And also a lot of overwhelm of just their own capacity as adults in the home to both manage um, the things that they need to do and then assist with distance learning, especially if the student is used to having a one-on-one -on -one para or, 
or just a lower student uh, student teacher ratio, maybe a classroom pair that's able to circulate. On this slide, you'll see some bullet points from an interview that I conducted with a student with low incidence disability uh, in the New Orleans area. So this is a young adult student um, between the age of 18 and 22 who was attending a transition program for students with low incidence disabilities at the time of COVID. I spoke to the student about their experience and asked them a lot of questions about what they thought worked well, why they thought those things worked well, and what things um, that they think teachers could improve upon. So these were the things that that student had to say. They said <clears throat> that teachers should try to utilize the tech platforms that students are already familiar with whenever possible. The student said that they had had a really pretty seamless transition to distance learning and that there hadn't been a lot of hiccups or bumps in the road. When I asked them why they thought that was, they noted this, that most of the platforms like Google Classroom, a couple other, um, other learning platforms that they use the most were ones that the teacher was already using in some form or fashion in the physical classroom. So that familiarity with the platform itself helped ease the transition to distance learning. Another thing the student tagged, um, when I asked them, you know, if you could say nothing else, if you could just say one thing to teachers who want to work really hard to make this a good experience for their students, what would you tell them? And so I put this direct quote that the student said, try to understand where they're at. And they elaborated saying like, that they just hope that teachers would try to make the instruction fit the student and not the other way around. The exciting thing to me about this quote and the fact that this is high priority on this student's mind is that distance learning actually affords us some opportunities that we wouldn't normally have in the physical classroom to do exactly this, to tailor instruction, make it more flexible and individualized for students. Another thing the student said was that um, they enjoyed having peer interaction in their classes and they were able to do that through uh, vocal interaction through Zoom calls or other platforms as well as um, the chat box as well. Now this student is able to, um, to read and write fluently and use the chat box and they said that many of their peers were as well. That may not always be the case in a low incidence classroom, but there are other uh, there are other ways that you can facilitate peer interaction and the student said that that was really helpful in class. And finally, they said it really helps when teachers oh, almost overly clarify and model directions, really taking the time to, to make steps clear and observable and numbered and when at all possible modeling those directions. When you're using a platform like Zoom or Google Meet, sharing your screen can be a really effective way to be able to model directions for students. Now we're going to move into talking about some strategies to support families and students during distance learning. So first, I want to kind of break down what when we're talking about students with low incidence disabilities and distance learning, what actually is different and what things actually remain the same. So there are some things, and I hope that this will be an encouraging slide uh, for teachers who may be feeling their own sense of overwhelm at the prospect of planning distance learning, um, that there are a lot of things that remain the same. We still have an expectation and structures in place to provide free and appropriate public education to students, all students. Another thing that's the same is we still have opportunities to work together as an IEP team to support that first bullet point. We also still the same, just as if we were in the physical classroom, we have the necessity of understanding how racism, oppression, and trauma affect student experiences. We have access to tech tools and free resources to support students in their learning. And we still have that necessity of taking and responding to student data. All of these things were things that existed 
and were expectations that were set in the physical classroom. And when we were there, there were sometimes barriers to meeting all of these things. That is still the same in distance learning. We still have tools at our disposal, we still have opportunities, and we still have barriers. The good news is teachers are incredibly good problem solvers. And just as we were inventive and creative about overcoming those barriers in the physical classroom, we can do the same thing with distance learning. So what is actually different? Here's some things that are different about distance learning for students with low instance disabilities. The school environment, obviously that might be the, the most obvious one, is different. And learning routines and schedules are most likely going to be drastically different. Students' access to their typical supports or support aids may be different. Even if in this new semester, students are interacting with their usual paras, it's gonna be in a different way. They're going to be interacting through a screen or through a phone or through a, a, a family member relaying information. They won't be able to have physical access. Peer interaction, similarly, is going to be different. Even though students hopefully are able to get some peer interaction through their classes, it's going to be through a screen, it's going to be different. There might be new barriers to learning through digital platforms that we didn't encounter in the classroom. And then this one I really want to highlight because I feel like it's one of the most salient ones and it's one of the ones that I hear the most from families in this moment is just that idea of parent and caretaker overwhelm or limited capacity the desire to want to help their student and support them with distance learning, but also needing to balance that with all of the other needs in the home. And finally, we may have to use different methods for taking and responding to student data as all of these other bullet points start to look a little different. So now that we know what the differences actually are, let's take a moment a few moments to talk about strategies that we can use to support those differences. <clears throat> the first one I want to point out is the school environment and learning routines. So I put up these two um, memes, screen grabs, as to give us an idea of where we want to land. So we're thinking somewhere between this which some of you might remember, this was a graphic that circulated around social media quite a lot at the beginning of quarantine and the beginning of distance learning, made by a parent or a teacher that was giving suggestions of a, <clears throat> a highly structured routine, daily routine for distance learning. So this level of structure and rigidity in scheduling probably won't work very well for students with low instance disabilities. We want to think somewhere between that level and this level on the bottom, which is just one of my favorite Mr. Rogers memes where um, he's, he's trying to draw a house and he's, he's not very good at it, but he's just kind of, that's not the point, it doesn't matter. So we don't want to give up. We don't want to say that structure doesn't matter, um, but we also don't want to be so so tied to and invested in trying to recreate a rigid full day structure like they had at, uh, at their physical school building. We don't wanna be so tied to that idea that we miss opportunities to create flexibility, ease, and individualization in their schedules. So there's a lot of wiggle room between these two pictures and that's what we wanna aim for and find what works for each student. <clears throat> some ideas about how we can do that and how we can explore that is we can consider these things. We can consider family rhythms. When do brothers and sisters wake up? When does the student wake up? When are adults in the house at work or occupied with other tasks? We can consider medical needs. How much time needs to be allotted for medication, feeding, physical therapies, etc. And then we can also pay closer attention to this individual student's attention span. <clears throat> this can be something 
that we can take a lot of data on, a lot of baseline data on maybe at the beginning of the semester. Having parents or caretakers help track how long can a student really meaningfully engage with this material before they need a break. Once we know that, we can tailor the instruction to support that. And finally, really starting to zoom out a little bit and think more about weekly schedules over daily schedules. So does it make more sense to do the most difficult work on Mondays and Tuesdays? Should Saturday be a school day where families are working on school because that's when there's more people in the home to support? There really can be a lot of creativity that goes into making a student schedule if the relationship building is there between teachers and families so that they, the IEP team is collaborating to come together and make that schedule. Because as you'll notice, a lot of these things you might not know as the teacher. A lot of these things to answer these questions on this slide, you need to have a good relationship with the family. You need to be in contact with them. You need to really understand their needs and their home life. So this next one, student access to their typical supports or support aids. These are some strategies that can help mitigate the possible frustration of that for students or the transition of it. Teachers can uh, conference with their paraprofessionals and help paraprofessionals conference with families. You can schedule regular check-ins. You can also share with the family, especially at the beginning of the semester, ways that the para was supporting the student at school. A para I know um, did a really great job of this and spent some time during summer PD filming just short little three to five minute um, instructional videos that showed a parent exactly how to do a learning activity that the student was used to doing in class. It was really helpful, it was visual, um, it helped to build relationship, and it also really supported the adult in the home, making them feel confident in being able to do this activity the way it was in class. And I think it did that much more effectively than it would have been if the teacher had just written a long email with five paragraphs explaining how to do the activity. We can also determine which ways need to be replicated during distance learning. So which things about how a para was supporting a student actually need to be replicated and which things might need to be um, just moved around or deprioritized depending on uh, what the student's learning schedule looks like. And finally, I think this one is really important at the bottom. We need to reassess these support needs on an ongoing basis and recognize that in this moment in time, every week is different. Sometimes every day is different um, in a family's home during distance learning and during the many transitions of COVID, especially as we transition in and out of phases and adults in the home, their work may be stopping or starting or slowing down or their schedule might change often. Because we know that, we need to communicate to families and make them feel comfortable communicating back to us those transitions. How we set up something at the beginning of the year for distance learning does not need to be the way it is set in stone, um, you know, just rigid in that way. We can be flexible and we can come back to the table as often as we need to, to reassess support needs and strategize around them. This next one, we're talking about those potential new barriers to learning through digital platforms. These are just a couple of ideas of ways that you might be able to mitigate that for students. Really though, this one is going to be one of the most individualized uh, things that you'll encounter. Each student is going to have a different set of support needs and a different set of accommodations and modifications that will be meaningful and helpful for them. So it really will go on a case by case basis. There's no one size fits all for this, but these are just some suggestions to get you thinking and, um, and maybe give you some jumping off points. So there's some ideas here about like 
if a student, if you notice a student is having trouble focusing on digital platforms like Zoom, you can start to evaluate what parts of those lessons might be able to be delivered in person by a family member or modified to be independent activities. If touchscreen Chromebooks or iPads are available to students through your school, of course, we want to prioritize students with low incidence disabilities receiving them as well, because there are so many free resources right now that are web based browser based that students can access. Um, you can also for for one very common accommodation of providing read aloud, you could download a screen reader tool like Google Reader Write to provide those read aloud accommodations so that a, a human doesn't have to do that each time. And then you want to also you can also be mindful of sensory input in online learning. Consider things like muting background music and sounds. Um, if the student steam, seems overstimulated, trying to find a, a quiet place in the home, if possible, to conduct distance learning, things like that. All right, this next one, parent caretaker overwhelm or limited capacity. A couple of ways that we can support that. This first one is probably the most, I would say the most important and the one that I've found to be most, most transformational for families is when teachers are communicating to parents in a super positively framed way, offering specific and tangible ways to support and reminding them that basically whatever they are able to do is great, rather than immediately making them feel, um, making them feel bad and unsuccessful when they accidentally miss a Zoom or um, aren't able to finish all the homework the first two weeks. Um, keeping that positive frame is just like we do for our students. It's just how we are as humans. We respond better to that. We want to feel successful. Parents very much want to feel successful with their students during distance learning. Um, one of those tangible ways, the reason I put specific and tangible is that I think that that can be a huge lever too. So a lot of times I've seen teachers saying, you know, to parents, please reach out, let me know if you need support, let me know if you need help. That is extremely good natured and the, the good intention is there, but parents often don't really know what specifically to ask for and aren't really sure what they need. They just know that there's a problem or something's not working. The more specific we can be in the ways that we're offering help to families can make a huge difference. So a good reframe for that is instead of just, instead of saying, let me know if you need help, try offering, hey, why don't we schedule a weekly check-in on Fridays for 15 minutes and you can let me know how this class went. On the parents end, they may not have known that they could even request such a thing. But in your mind, you know that that's super easy. And now you've got it on the calendar, you've got a specific tangible way that you're supporting families they're going to be much more likely to stay engaged. So kind of similar to that, that second bullet point, you can also offer to provide Zoom or over the phone walkthroughs, tutorials for any of the things that are sticking points for parents, new digital platforms, homework, pretty much anything. Um, as often as you can treat Zoom like it's being face to face, you can use it for more things than, than you can even imagine. And finally, consider adjusting the distance learning schedule to better align to parents' daily schedules and the rhythm of the home. We've touched on this with other bullet points, but it's really important to reiterate, as much as you can, try to adjust to the rhythm of the home. That's gonna help parents feel more successful and help uh, keep them engaged in supporting their students. And finally, we do, we do and may have different methods for taking and responding to student data during distance learning. So one way that we can make sure that that taking that data is still happening, we can conference with parents and caregivers and bring them in and try to help collaborate with them on them on taking data for IEP goals that need to be tracked. So there's a lot of things that you are probably tracking in the classroom that parents or caretakers can help you track in the home as long as they feel confident doing it. 
So it really may only take you just sitting down with them one or two times, showing them what needs to be tracked and giving them the tools to do it. Whether that's um, tally marks on a note on their phone or whether it's a shared Google Doc where they write some notes each day. There's lots of different options. You just may need to do some digging with the parent on what is easiest for them and what is gonna be lowest lift. And finally, one really important collaboration piece is as many times as possible, you as a teacher then taking that data and converting it to something that's digital and shared so that all related service providers and IEP teams can stay updated virtually. This is extra important because you know that those related service providers, all of those other stakeholders, just like you, they're not getting as much face time, they're not getting any face time, and they're not getting as much digital time with the student as they normally would. So they're going to need to see as much data as possible to get a clear image of how to support that student. So circling back around to kind of wrap it all up, this is my at a glance slide, my, my summary of five quick hits. If you remember nothing else, take a picture of this slide, refer back to it when you feel stuck. These are the guiding principles and the five things that really were in my mind as I was creating this training. The principles that guide me as I'm coaching teachers on how to support students with low incidence disabilities during distance learning, um, reminding them to partner with parents and caregivers to really approach this as a team, presuming competence with students, trying things, not assuming that something isn't going to work, but giving it a try, striving for flexible and organized or organic learning routines, prioritizing those high interest activities that will keep the kids engaged, and then again, constant collaboration with other service providers so that students are getting the benefit of their full IEP team support. That wraps up today's webinar on supporting students with low incidence disabilities during distance learning. I hope that you were able to take away some guiding principles and some tangible tips and tricks that will help you in your classroom this year. If you're interested in more special education and COVID-19 resources, please visit us at www.selfnola.org.